our call to worship, 1 Peter 3, in the first two verses. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. You'd like to stand, wouldn't you? Let's stand together and sing, God is Holy. If you'd like your book, it's number 66, God is Holy. holy, God is mighty, and we praise his matchless name for he is worthy. Let us worship and adore him as we call upon his name. God is holy, God is mighty, we will praise thee. With thy blood on Calvary's cross thou hast redeemed us, and the blood which thou hast shed for us demands our sing forevermore. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you'd follow as I read verses 10 through 16. But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or, sis or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? We thank the Lord for his word this morning uh, in this powerful passage. Let's sing together again, Be Thou My Vision. 374 in your hymnal. Be thou my vision. <clears throat> in 
time, Margaret and Sharon are going to come and minister in song. So I want to inter interfere in your 
progress this morning. Can I go sit down? You can go sit down for a moment. As everyone, or most everyone knows here, that uh, October is Pastor Appreciation uh, Month. And this day we're going to uh, honor Pastor and Kim, if you would step forward as well, and the deacons. Behind every good pastor there's a good wife. And uh, they both work hard for us. And we're taking this time to uh, honor them and tell them how much we love them. We usually take up a monetary gift for them, and uh, we did that throughout the month, and here we are. See? So I, I really want to, want to thank each and every one of you. If you don't know what past appreciation is, if you haven't been here before, it's once a year we, we try to um, uh, just show them that we love them and appreciate everything that they've done throughout the year. It's, a, it's a, an amazing thing that they do. Some of us only see them once a week. We see Kim once a week or, or whatever it might be, but behind the scenes, they're doing amazing things. They're doing visitations, they're doing, uh, you know, uh, t classes, they're doing uh, the bulletins you read each week. It just, uh, an, an awesome thing, and they they do have a, a big task ahead of ahead of them and before them each and every week, and so we want to appreciate that. And I want to thank each and every one of you this year, without saying dollars and cents. Wow, you really stepped up, and and it's an amazing thing when we can just tell them how much we love them. And if you know me, though, there's always a couple of little extras that we like, like to give them. This is just, um, it's always an unusual thing. I, I don't know why, but it's just the way I do things. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, we have a couple of extra gifts. I'm going to give them, uh, start with Pastor, because he's, he's like, I don't know. He's, he's the most fun, I guess. <laughs> so the, the, first, the first one I, uh, I found for him, though, and I know Pastor, he, he, he likes things made out of wood, and he enjoys things like this. We found this. It's, it's a little um, box, and it has a wooden pen in it and a wooden display so he can keep that on his desk. And it's made out of rosewood and maple, and um, to, to, to add to the story, Pastor is also a, uh, a gel pen lover. So this is also a gel pen. So you get two for the price of one. Yep. And it comes with a couple of extra refills, so that's an awesome thing. So, so you enjoy that. I'll let you put it back in a box. <laughs> oh, sorry. And then this, the, the other thing we got past there, and this is really an unusual thing, is it comes in this box, in this beautiful box. And you take it, if I can get it out. Beautiful little uh, wooden box. And in, inside it, Inside it is this beautiful little compass. It's a little compass. So just 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 so past so we'll know where he's going, where he's been. Yeah. That's that's so I don't get lost out back to the church again. That yeah, it, it, the story has it. You know, a, a while back he he took a, a hike in in the, the trails behind the church. Took him a couple of hours to get back because <laughs> he couldn't figure out where he was going, I guess. But this this little compass is is, is a beautiful thing. It has scripture written in the, in the cover, and it says, "I will guide you along the way, the best pathway of your life. I will advise you and watch over you." And it's Psalms 32:8. And if you, if you stop and ask them to show it to you at the door, it has uh, south, west, east, and north says God on it. So 
So no matter where he's at, he can always be facing God. So we give him that and, and hope that he will display and enjoy it and um, have a good time with that. Make sure you carry it when you go hunting, <laughs> just in case. Uh, and so with Kim, we got, got her one thing. And I, 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 I don't know, they can open it up if they want to, but it's, it's a beautiful throw. Beautiful throw. I'll let you keep the bag. But this throw it, uh, measures 90 by 90. So it'll cover your bed and then some. But it, it's soft, it's beautiful, and it has the words written on it. If you want it, you don't want to open it. No, it's really, <laughs> you know? It says on the front of, front of it, happy moments, praise God, difficult moments, seek God, quiet moments, worship God, painful moments, trust God, every moment, thank God. So, the theme of all these things is actually it was, was Matthew 6.33, and it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And so, whether you're seeking with a compass, or penning your, your weekly uh, sermons, or wrapping yourself in the quilt, or in a comforter, our thoughts was with the comforter, that when you're feeling low, when you're having a hard day, wrap yourself in it and consider it a hug from the church. So, thank you. We, we appreciate it. You can have that. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, in <laughs> Uh, let's just take a moment and thank God for our pastor and his wife. Heavenly Father, we look to you, Lord, this day, praising you for our pastor and his wife. There are many churches, Lord, that are, are suffering this day without pastors. Lord, the, the word needs to be proclaimed from the pulpit in every place. So we're grateful that you have given us uh, these two. Lord, we love them dearly. And we know that their tasks are, are great. And, and uh, we ask and pray that we would just uh, be faithful to uh, serve alongside them. Lord, raise soldiers up that they might have the, the tools to... Um, um, be able to teach and preach and, and be able to show the world that God needs to be in every home. Thank you, dear Father, for it all. We ask for your blessings upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I'm supposed to preach? Um, A little bit. <laughs> You don't have to be that honest. Well, you know the story about the preacher that was leafing through all the pages of his sermon, muttering to himself and kind of into the microphone, you know, where to begin, oh, where to begin. And a young voice from the back pipe, piped up and said, as close to the end as possible. Uh, kids can escape to junior church if they like. I thank you all so much. Uh, it's... A gift is a humbling thing. Uh, that's the nature of a heartfelt gift. It's a humbling thing, and it's an encouraging thing. Pastor Branham called me after the church. I uh, had a, a question and answer time with him before they voted to call us here. You realize that's over 15 years ago that happened. And somebody asked the question, uh, are the Haymans in it for the long haul, or are they going to hit and run? 
are they going to leave us hanging? The pastor says, I'll take the liberty to answer. I took the liberty to answer for you, brother. I told them, if they love, if he pastor said, if you love Hamans like you've loved us, they'll be here a long time. And this is the 16th time you've given us a gift at uh, pastor appreciation time, and uh, that speaks to it. I'll be honest with you, things tend to go in um, uh, flurries, I guess. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, some months are harder than others. You'd be amazed how many times October is a hard month. And uh, you folks have encouraged us. I praise the Lord for my wife. Um, it's absolutely a two for one. You get both of us. And uh, she's just busier uh, every year, busier. Uh, I pray we have some folk who come in and some folk who step up and we can take some things off her shoulders because uh, uh, I'm it's, it's the place I don't want to put another straw uh, on her back. Uh, she's that kind of busy, but we so appreciate it, and it's such an encouragement. I have to pretend every year that I don't know this is coming. Um, Hector one year decided that he was going to be smart and they were going to wait until November um, to fuss and to present a gift, and uh, it was really clever. Um, I came in with my resignation letter all but signed, and uh, not really. Uh, it was surprising. This is true. Uh, but we so appreciate you, and uh, we appreciate our co-laborers, those that minister uh, with us here, uh, are an absolute blessing. And uh, we appreciate how you look after us and are concerned about us. And um, I was really, um, Sue, forgive me for mentioning it, but Sue gave me a, a basket or a bag full of goodies last week. And um, they were all healthy goodies. Uh, it's always a joke, I know, right? But I need that right now. And... Um, it's, it's always a joke that people hire a pastor to fatten him up. Uh, I remember Dick Clark looking at me, and that was 50 pounds ago, and Dick says, yep, you're going to be here and you're going to balloon. And he wasn't kidding either. Uh, there's a conspiracy to fatten up the preacher, but uh, Sue set a nice precedent with really healthy, healthy with fruits and snacks and pistachios and heart-healthy pistachios. Got to love those, but uh, I thank you all very, very much and uh, sure appreciate it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, it's, it's heavy, it's deep. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, we moved across country from California to central Pennsylvania uh, from a pretty neat church of probably 80 people, very, very multi-ethnic. Uh, we had almost every state, and it seemed like half the country is represented in that little church. Uh, when we had a carry-in dinner, it was an international affair, and it was a lot of fun. And then we moved to central Pennsylvania to a larger church, and it was a church that had a, the previous pastor had made a, kind of made a train wreck with his divorce policy and how he handled it. And so divorce and remarriage was, the, it's a hot button anywhere, but in that church it was a huge hot button. My dad was there a full year, and he hadn't preached on it yet, and people wanted to hear him about it. And basically he got pestered till he'd pray about it and preach it. And so he started a Sunday evening service about divorce and remarriage, and the very first Sunday, a couple paragraphs into his sermon, several families stood up and left and never came back. Uh, that was how divisive a thing it was. I think they were waiting to see which side he'd come down on, and there were people that had all kinds of different views. Uh, there is an astounding amount of false teaching uh, that's around about marriage, and uh, we need to stick to God's word. And add to that that some of the passages like this one are difficult. They're not just difficult by their subject matter, but Paul speaks in a way here that he never uses these terms anywhere else. I speak by con concession and not command, and I say not the Lord. And, and so all of a sudden we have reason to sit here and doubt that what we're reading before us, is this truly the word of God? Is this take it to the bank scripture? Or is it not? And I'll, I'll skip ahead that much to tell you, it's scripture, period. And we'll do our best to explain where Paul's coming from and, and help you to get your head around that too and understand what he's trying to say in all of this. Uh, remember that uh, Corinth was a crossroads town. It was this little tiny isthmus between the Adriatic and the Aegean Seas today. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, canal that goes right through that. It's just a two-mile canal is all it takes to get from the Aegean to the Adriatic uh, to take things from Italy to Turkey and back and so forth. Uh, in their day, they would often carry ships or else the cargo over that strip of land because 
sailing down around the Peloponnesus at the very bottom of Greece. That's dangerous water uh, between Greece and the island of Malta, some places like that. Tremendously dangerous water, and people today still try to stay out of there, even in much more capable ships. Uh, and then it was the only way to get from the Macedonian side of Greece and Athens down to Sparta in the Peloponnesus, and so everybody came and went, and with all the people traveling through, you made money. And so it was a very wealthy place, and it became a very uh, unregenerate and immoral place. Uh, it was Las Vegas, New Orleans, and San Francisco rolled into one times ten. Uh, there was a thousand temple prostitutes in the local temple, and that was how they worshipped, was by engaging these prostitutes. Um, they, very frankly, forgive me, but um, homosexuality, bisexuality, group activities, wife swapping, those were the world that these people got saved out of. And so why wouldn't they be messed up in terms of how to process marriage? And as we talked about last week, physical love in marriage, which is what, a lot of what this passage is about. They saw sex as being evil because all the sex that was around them was evil. But we recognize that it's God's wonderful plan inside marriage. It's his beautiful plan for the propagation of the race, but also for enjoyment and betterment and growth of husband and wife. Uh, that they have that relationship together. And so what was happening is there were Corinthians who got saved, and maybe both parties got saved, and now they thought, well, you know what? Sex is dirty, and they don't go near each other anymore. And then there's the fella who gets saved and his wife doesn't, or the lady who gets saved and the husband doesn't, and they don't know what to do now. And some people are saying, hey, they don't know the Lord. You have to divorce them. And so that's a lot of the backdrop to what Paul's talking about. Um, there's a, um, he's answering their questions. This is the section where he says, now concerning the things you wrote me about, and isn't it interesting that sex is at the top of that list, considering the things that you wrote me about, and, and here, he, here he comes. Um, we need to go uh, back a few verses, more than what I have on slides. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, we'll go back to uh, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 7. He has told husbands and wives, verse 5, Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, it should be the norm that husband and wife enjoy each other uh, in their alone time. And for them to, to, for one to deny the other that is uh, to be disobedient to God. Uh, he has said in the previous verse, the wife belongs to the husband and the husband belongs to the wife. Uh, they don't belong to themselves but to each other. And uh, he lays it out there. Now he comes to other people, verse 6, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so Paul says, I say this by way of concession, not command. Don't let that take the, the authority out of it. The scripture tells us clearly about itself. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So how much scripture is inspired? All of it. Every last word of it. And so when Paul says this, we're, we're not to read that these are Paul's words, not God's. We might read these are Paul's words as led along by the Holy Spirit. Prophecy didn't come in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were carried along, carried aloft by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture, and he uses these individuals, he uses their backgrounds, their vocabularies, their personalities uh, to write, but he superintends it so that it is using man's words, yet it is truly the Word of God. Uh, one of the reasons I give for it when we study bibliology and how we got our Bible and, and how we study our Bible and so forth is that you and I understand each other, we share a language, we share a lot of, of common plights, 
we're in the same boat, so to speak, as mortal humans, and we understand each other. In the same way that I've, I've expressed before, I've had times where I tried all class period to get a student to understand something in theology with, with the high school seniors, and I couldn't get her to grasp it, and, and the end of the period was the beginning of lunch, and one of the boys said, Mr. Heyman, could I stay here with her and you, and could I try to explain this to her? And in about three minutes, using my stapler, my pencil cup, and a couple of other things as, as little illustrations on my desk, he got her to get it. Why? Because they were both 17, and they spoke the same language. And as much as I'd like to pretend differently, it's been a long time since I was 17. Um, God used human authors so humans would understand. He used human authors so humans would identify. But the Holy Spirit superintended it so that it is absolutely the word of the Lord. And because it's the word of the Lord, it is accurate. It is trustworthy and accurate, and it is authoritative. These are not the, will, the words of some man. Men are imperfect and, and, and fallible. This is the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. And so here... He's giving it to them. In verse 6, he's making a suggestion to them that he understands is not the overarching picture of Scripture, but with the Holy Spirit's complete knowledge and uh, oversight, he's suggesting that it's good for people, if they can live single, that they ought to live single. He says, even as I am. Paul was over 30 years old. We know this because... He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Paul was married at one time. Paul was a divorce, or was not a divorcee. Paul was a widow. And so Paul talks about Peter, who gets to take along a believing wife. She travels with him. And Paul says, you know, am I the only guy who doesn't get to do that? And so Paul understood himself to be the exception. He was widowed, and he was satisfied and, and capable to live apart from having a woman in his life. He was able to live without the physical part of marriage that's, that he had once and lost. And not everybody can do that. Some folk can handle singleness in the first place. Some folk can't handle it after they've been married and that's been their experience and it's a very difficult thing for them to do. He tell, Paul says elsewhere to let the young widows marry because it's better to marry than to get into trouble. And he, he basically comes to the same place here. Uh, he says everybody has his gift from the Lord. Some people can live single and be satisfied. Some people can live single and stay out of trouble. Not everybody can. And so that's the, why you have a wife. If, if Husbands have a wife and wives a husband. But if you can live without that and you're not already there, he's going to tell you later if you're saved and you're single, hey, don't be in a hurry to get married. See what God will do. If you're saved and you're married, hey, don't get unmarried because you're saved. That's never God's will. And so he gives those things to us pretty plainly here. Uh, Christ himself had spoken to many of these questions, but Paul mentioned the preferability of singleness for some without having a quote from the Lord. Most of what he says here, you, he could chapter and verse it and go back to the Gospels and so, show you what Jesus said himself. Uh, the Spirit is leading him. Uh, he's careful to assert that celibacy for either the single or the widowed is not for everybody. It's a gift. He talks about the things that a single person can accomplish for the Lord. Um, Again, I remember having a, a, a friend who stood in faculty devotions and told the single ladies there how easy they had it because they didn't have kids to look after or a spouse to look after like he did. Oh, goodness, I, those poor ladies, I saw their eyes. I saw the groan on their face. Uh, he had no clue. Uh, the fact is, you know, he had a loving wife who took good care of him. And, and you know, his kids were young, and young kids are work. There's no two ways about that. Uh, but you ask him today as a grandpa, and he'd tell you he wouldn't trade places with any of them. And our single ladies, well, they had to go home, and they had to take care of everything at home, too. And uh, they didn't have somebody around when their toilets got clogged, and so they called Mr. Heyman usually for that one. Uh, I was glad to help. But the fact of the matter is uh, there's work on both sides of that equation, and uh, there are difficult things to deal with in both sides of that equation, and we need to respect each other in it. Um, he says that marriage is preferable to falling into sin. He says to the unmarried and to the widows, verse 8, it's good for them if they remain even as I, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And if you have a good translation, the words with passion are in italics. That means they were added because that's the sense of it, but we're not pretending that was in the original Greek. 
that is the sense of it. Better to marry than to burn. Better to marry than to get into trouble. So it could be taken better to marry than to burn in punishment if we're talking about unsafe folk. Or it could be better, better taken, I think, as it is here than to burn with passion. Uh, better to give that part of your life an outlet that is in a God's control and what God has ordained than to leave yourself outside of that. And as I said last week, I think it's a big problem in churches that have celibate priesthood. They're asking for trouble in that part of their lives. Uh, man is not meant to, be, to live alone. Uh, some of them are gifted that way, but most are not. So now we get to verse 10, and uh, he's going to talk to other people. God's plan. Believing spouses are to remain married. Verse 10, but to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord. In other words, it's not just me talking, but I can take you to what Jesus said himself. And um, that would be in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, he says, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart. But it wasn't always so. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, he's quoting Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall be one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Marriage is sacred. It is God's intention. It is God's invention. It is sacred before God. God uses it as a picture of Christ and the church. He says to the husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church and never forget Christ died for his church. Uh, that's the utmost of it and needs to be. Malachi 2, the end of verse 15 into verse 16 says, Take heed then to your spirit. Let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh, God says, I hate divorce. King James says, I hate putting away, uh, which is what's being intended here. Uh, marriage is precious before God, and he hates the disillusion of it. By the way, this is a hard thing to preach and to preach part of your view. And in, in the time that we have here, I'm not going to develop everything I think the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. If you've been here a while, you've heard me on it. If you have questions, you can ask me. Uh, some of them are, are going to get answered, actually, as this chapter progresses. Uh, but uh, bear with me, and uh, don't you up and leave the church over it. Come pick my brain and uh, say, is this what you're saying? Is this not what you're saying? And so forth. Uh, I think there's a lot to it. Um, God provides here, though, here as well. Um <sighs> The wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, verse 11, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. I have seen cases where a husband and wife are split. They kind of need to be for a period of time. Uh, there's something that, that is there that, that makes a, a problem, and I have seen wives that have said, listen, I'm not divorcing you. I'm not going to meet up with anybody else. There's not going to be another man in my, wife, in my life. If you come back, I'm here for you, and I'm here for you alone. Um, that is an extraordinarily hard thing to do, and my utmost respect goes to those who have done it, and my delight to see some who have done it, and God has blessed it and seen them back together. Uh, what a joy that is to see. Uh, so he tells us um, what to do. To the rest, verse 12, I say. So he's talked about those that are believing, man and wife. He's talked to those that are as yet single or are widowed, and now to the rest, well, the rest is really a mixed marriage. By all I will ever mean by a mixed marriage, by the way, has nothing to do with race or ethnicity. It has everything to do with saved and unsaved. That's a mixture. And so Corinthians tells us elsewhere that, that we can't have, you know, uh, intermarriage or really partnerships of any kind with the unbelieving uh, because we're not on the same page with the Spirit of the Lord between us. Scripture tells us that. And uh, here... Uh, he addresses what happens if now you're saved and she isn't, or you're saved and he isn't. What do you do about that? To the rest, I say, not the Lord, but if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. So this is equal on either side. By the way, in the world before Christ, there was not an equality about the dissolution of a marriage. The wife had far less to say about it than the husband did. 
he could send her away and in their culture and practice it was much easier for him to do that than for her to dissolve a marriage it was virtually unheard of in the new testament era it had hap it would come to happen both ways and so he addresses it in both directions if you have an unsafe spouse and they don't want you there you don't have to stay there if you have an unsafe spouse and they don't want to stay there they don't have to stay there if you have a safe spouse you hold on tight if you have an unsafe spouse who is willing to keep you and not leave then you stay you're bound uh, I personally don't think this is this is immediate grounds for remarriage but I think there is a time and a place where she doesn't have to live with him and he doesn't have to live with her usually for me where this gets really really difficult is in both emotional and physical abuse and does he want you, can he, if his mouth is saying he wants you there, but his fist is saying something different, you need to think long and hard about that. And I have to tell you, I, I tell people my job is to protect marriage. Having said that, nobody would ever pretend that it's not my job to protect a wife from her husband if it ever came to that. And, and that's a hard thing. We encourage them to, to fulfill this passage in First Peter and it's not easy and there's been times where I've sent a wife back to her husband and man I've just been up all night praying about it uh, it's one of the most ticklish things in, in ministry at all and it's a difficult difficult thing for a couple on either side uh, but the bottom line here is with the unbeliever you're not bound to live with that person and be a spouse to that person remember a couple verses earlier he's talking about being a spouse in terms of your physical expressions of love to each other he's saying you're not bound to that if they don't want you there and so if they put you away or send you away or they go away and they're unsaved you're not bound to stay with them uh, he tells us that we've been called to peace um, for the unbelieving husband and um, let me make sure I'm not missing something here. Uh, John 4 by the way verses 16 through 18 I've told people we've, we've talked about it recently in, a, in an evening service or two I, I've come to really appreciate John 4 I'll give you the gist of it in the interest of time John 4 is the woman at the well it's an astounding passage it really helps us to deal with the world we live in today the world we live in today which you know let's be honest in the last 10 years or so racial tensions have been have been you know the flames have been fanned and people have tried to stir up I think there's there's more tension in America today than there's been in a couple of decades on the subject of race. Saddens me completely. Moving to California was good for me. Being one of three white kids in my seventh grade class, that was a healthy experience for me. I realized friendship had nothing to do with the color of skin. I had realized that long before, but that just made it crystal clear to me and, and shaped my thinking in that regard. At the same time, don't tell me I'm racist because I'm white. Please don't understand that my family wore blue and fought hard on the right side of the Civil War and I am personally offended for anyone to refer to me as racist. You have no right nor, nor any way, anything to hang that on. Uh, that's not true. Uh, and I, I'm very disturbed by the idea getting pushed that everybody is, they just don't know it. Oh, please. Uh, let's talk about that scientifically, let alone otherwise. Uh, no truth to it. But uh, it's being stirred up, and so how do we deal across races and ethnicities with each other? Here's Jesus. He's walking through the middle of Samaria. Do you know Jews didn't walk through the middle of Samaria? Because they didn't want to see Samaritans. They had a distinct prejudice against the Samaritans. The Samaritans were unclean. They had mixed races, and more than that, they had mixed their religion, and they had, they had watered down the truth of God's word. And so the Israelites and the Samaritans, oil and water, they avoided each other in both directions. They would walk way out around. Samaria is right in the middle of Israel, and they'd walk way around to avoid. And here's Jesus. He goes right down through the middle. He stops at Jacob's well, interestingly enough, in the middle of Samaria. And he asks a Samaritan woman for water. And she's gobsmacked. How is it that you, a Jewish man, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? That just never happens. And he tells her about the living water that he has for her. And then he kind of he sets her up just a little. He says, go and tell your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you've well said you have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the man you're with now isn't your husband. You said that right. So while God 
hates divorce. While divorce was not God's plan, but he, Moses allowed it because of the hardness of the human heart, God does recognize second and subsequent marriages. Understand what I mean by that. I'd have students come to me when we'd read a passage that dealt with divorce. What am I? I belong to my mom and not my dad. What am I? And, and I'm from a mixed family. And what am I? And what does that make me? And uh, are my parents living in sin? They're neither of them with their first spouses. Well, I'll say this. When you make, when you make vows to number two, that's it. You owe number two every fidelity, period. God recognizes second marriages, and he doesn't want them to dissolve because they're second marriages. And even with this lady, all the way to number five, young people won't get it, but if he was talking to Elizabeth Taylor, we know what his answer would be. Richard Burton, both times. It's not God's plan, but for the orderliness of the world, he recognizes second and subsequent marriages. By the way, he blesses off time, second and subsequent marriages. We've had so many people that God has blessed them incredibly the second time around. And I, for the kids that I taught who were so disturbed by it, I took them to thinking about David and Bathsheba. Of all the sons that David had, God chose, God chose Solomon to be the heir to the throne. Who was Solomon's mother? It was Bathsheba, a woman that David never should have gone within a hundred yards of. A woman whose husband David killed off. Does God bless us in spite of ourselves? Sure he does. Does he bless second and subsequent marriages? Sure he does. It doesn't excuse divorce. It's not God's plan. God hates putting away. But we understand uh, that he blesses us in spite of ourselves. Uh, he talks about here to the rest in verse 12. And um, believers are bound to a willing spouse. This includes the submission of a wife to an unbelieving husband. This includes the love of a husband toward an unbelieving wife. Um, we've talked about it just recently. I believe last week we talked about it here. God's plan for marriage in the family in Ephesians 5 and 6. He talks about how children are to deal with their parents and parents, fathers especially with their children, and how the husband's supposed to love the wife. He's a selfish person by nature. That's how sin has us being. We're selfish men. We're self-determined. We, we want to go our own way. In our world, women are being told they can do anything a man can do. They're told that they're self-determinant, and I am woman, hear me roar. And so she wants to live straight up, and he wants to live straight up. Just me, just me. Parallel lines never come together. So the Lord, there's two parts of that, two corrections to that. The Lord says to the husband, love her like you love yourself. Nurture her like you do yourself. To which I say to every man, most men are like me. We are big babies. We're tough and rugged and all until we get hurt or get a cold. My wife deserves a crown for all the times I've gotten a cold. I'll admit it. I'm a miserable, miserable patient. My poor, dear wife. I'm supposed to nurture my wife like I take care of myself when I'm hurting. I'm supposed to nurture her like I nurture my own body. I'm supposed to lean out of my comfort zone, past my point of balance, over towards her. She's supposed to submit to me. That doesn't mean she says I'm better than her. Oh, far from it. Best example of submission in the world is the Trinity. God the Father is no more God than God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, but God the Holy Spirit and God the Son voluntarily submit to the will of God the Father because that's what makes it work. I said just last week, fellas, submission is her gift to you. If you force it, it's not true godly submission. And it's not yours to force it. It's hers to give you in obedience to her Lord is what that is. Uh, and so we're to do our best and uh, to stay married to an unbelieving spouse, uh, praying to win them. Uh, notice in, the pa in a passage we did for um, Call to Worship, uh, she used to win her husband without a word. Um, it's tempting for a wife to preach to the husband. It's a sore temptation. It's very big. And uh, the point he's making is it's not what you say, it's how you live. It's what you model in front of him day to day is what Peter talks about. Um, <clears throat> things get sticky here a little bit in modern life. Is there a limit to the submission of the wife? If the husband says to the wife, I want you to commit adultery, I don't think she has to do it. 
if the husband says to the wife, I want you to participate in something debauched that involves somebody else, she doesn't need to. If the husband says to the wife, I want you to kill somebody for me, do you think she should do that? We have other scripture, don't we? We have the good sense God gave us, and we understand that there are extremes, even as it pertains to submission and obedience. If he's asking her to sin, and, and especially a moral sin, uh, she has a right and a, and a necessity to say no. Is there a limit to the love of the husband? I don't think there should be. Um, I think there needs to be forgiveness for the ultimates and uh, to the best of one's ability in both directions to forgive. God's authority structures matter. He is quite specific in these and other areas. There must be a limit on her obedience to him. That limit is further along than many teach. Uh, again, he's going to keep talking here about our testimony and how the world sees us. And in our world today, marriage has become cheap. People talk about first wives, you know, uh, or, or as if marriage is something you're trying out and getting your feet wet, and then you're going to trade up. It's a mess. Uh, I heard um, Jack Kemp, former NFL quarterback, uh, former senator, I think, maybe congressman, but senator, I think, at a point, and uh, uh, chair, chairman of Housing and Urban Development back in the day. I heard a speech he gave one time, and he talked about the breakdown of the home. And he says, it's not just in the barrio, it's not just in the ghetto, it is on snob knob. It's right how he put it. Because where men aren't staying faithful to their, to their families in the ghettos, rich people are trading in their wife for a trophy wife, and it's as bad in every respect. And it is. Across ethnic lines, across lines of have and have not, marriage has become tremendously cheap in our world. As Christians, we can't go there. As a pastor, I can't go there. We have to support it, encourage it, strengthen it, teach it uh, as the Lord does. The believing spouse sanctifies the home. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through a believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now are they holy. Uh, it's a tough thing. Uh, the, we've covered a lot of what's in the last couple verses here already. Uh, but the idea of sanctifying, well, what this does not mean, it does not mean that the unbelieving spouse is saved because the believing, house, believing spouse is. House and spouse, I've never done that one before. Uh, what it means, though, is that the believing spouse brings God's blessing on the home by staying there by being, whether the husband or the wife, being a spouse to the unbelieving spouse in every shape, way, shape, and form. Uh, the influence of a Christian lady in the home. We've seen it time and again. We've had many, frankly, kind of difficult unsaved husbands that have gotten saved in this church through the years. What an awesome blessing. Faithful women that were faithful for decades, and then the husband came around. I think of my grandmother. She, she was married three times. My, they all died. My dad, her son-in-law, would say cocky things like she was hard on them. The real truth was completely the opposite. The, all three of them were drinking men, and all three of them were terribly hard on her. The one in the middle was pretty good to her. I never met either of the first two, but the one in the middle was pretty good to her. But uh, they were married uh, about a year and a half before he passed away, and that was it. Uh, but she unfortunately had a type, and it was a type that was pretty hard on her. But the last one got saved. I've told you the story several times. A couple weeks before he went home, he got saved. What a blessing. That had a lot to do with my grandmother's testimony as God got more and more of her life as she grew in him as well. We need to be faithful and see. Uh, the believing spouse sanctifying the house. God blesses and preserves unsaved family members for the sake of the saved ones. Um, the, spiritual inf the believer exerts a spiritual influence in the home that, Lord willing, goes toward the salvation of the lost partner. A quote for you here. It is an act of disobedience for a Christian knowingly to marry an unsaved person. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, 6, 14. But if a person becomes a Christian after marriage, he should not use that as an excuse to break up the marriage just to avoid problems. In fact, Paul emphasized the fact that the Christian partner could have a spiritual influence on the unsaved mate. 1 Corinthians 7.14 does not teach that the unsaved partner is saved because of the believing mate, since each person much in, must individually decide for Christ. Rather, it means that the believer exerts a spiritual influence in the home that can lead to the salvation of the lost partner. Uh, 1 
1 Peter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Be submissive to your own husbands. By the way, this does not mean, this is not a, this passage is not saying males are superior to females and every female should submit to every male. That is absolutely not what this passage says. You notice what it says? Be submissive, again, that's your gift to him in obedience to Christ, Ephesians 5. Be submissive to your own husbands. It's not all womankind being submissive to all mankind. That's not really what he's after here at all. He's saying be submissive to your own husbands. Why? So that, in order that, even if any of them are disobedient to the word, and by the way, disobedient to the word, that broadens this. Paul is talking in 1 Corinthians 7 about the unbelieving spouse. Here, Peter is talking about the disobedient spouse, the spouse who's disobedient to the word. So that would include an unsaved spouse. It would also include a saved spouse who's not living for the Lord. I have several times seen people get in marriages that had a hard time because when they got married, the believer wasn't mature in the Lord, hadn't grown up at all in the Lord, and in, in most ways was not all that different from the unbeliever or the recent believer. And then... As the believer grew, now the gap got wider. I've seen it time and again when people get married and they're kind of not, their spiritual levels aren't that far off, even though one of them may have truly trusted Christ and the other one may not have. But as one of them grows in the Lord, it gets a whole lot harder because that gap happens. Uh, it's a thing to be aware of and to take note of. As we obey the Lord, uh, we have to pray his hand on all of it. Uh, but here he says, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if them are dis any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. This is hard. Uh, I don't believe in lady preachers, but we have ladies in our church who could teach you about this in ways I could never touch because they've lived it. In a day out and day in kind of a way, they've lived it. There is nothing easy about it. The prayer throughout is that not only will they be sanctified in the sense of the short term, but that they will be holy and eternally sanctified because they've gotten saved, because they've seen the testimony. That's the goal. That's the prayer. We've seen God answer it here. What a beautiful thing. Uh, ladies, my hat goes off to you. We're not easy to live with. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Verse 2 is they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. In other words, you're being right before the Lord, respectful toward the husband. Verse 3, your adornment must not be merely external. The braiding of the hair, the wearing of gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. Braiding the hair, it's really plating the hair. They used to weave um, their jewelry and their bling, if you will, into their hair. Uh, that was part of what they did. And it could get to be a rather gaudy thing. And he says it's not this grand gaudiness. It's not the dress is worn. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. The best beauty in the world is inside out. It permeates. It goes deep. For in this way the former times the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. This is one powerful little verse. You husbands, in the same way that she is to live for Christ by submitting to you, you better love her. Live with her in an understanding way. King James says, live with your wife according to knowledge. Be honest with you, I never got my head around that. What does that mean? It seemed rather obtuse, just according to knowledge. Here, I think far better uh, live with your wife in an understanding way. If you want to be really literal to it, you know what it means, guys? It means make a study of your wife. Pay attention to your wife. See what gives her joy, what gives her hurt. Endeavor to give her joy instead of hurt. See where she needs your help. See where she, listen to her and see where she can help you. Make a study of her. I joke that I should have a PhD in chemiology. 
I need to make a study of her. Fellas, we all need to make a study of our wife. That's a lot more selfless than we typically are, but it's exactly what God requires of us. To live with her in an understanding way is to study her out. Uh, don't get all upset with me at, with the phrase, as with someone weaker. Uh, you understand what he's saying here. She's precious. And you're supposed to treat her like she's precious. That's what he's getting here. Show her honor because she's a fellow believer, a fellow heir of the grace of God. And um, by the way, fellas, if you don't treat your, your wife right, it's going to hinder your prayers. There's two or three things that the Bible tells us in the New Testament can hinder our prayer life. One of them is not forgiving. Jesus says when you stand praying, forgive if you have something against somebody else. Because if you won't forgive, then neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you. So you better be forgiving when, before you come to pray. Uh, and, and having a haughty spirit and, and a wrong heart, uh, we're told, will hinder our prayers. Bitterness can hinder our prayers. And here it is, fellas, not living with your wife gently and lovingly and making a study of her and striving towards selflessness, that's going to hinder your prayers. That's going to hold back your spiritual life. That's going to keep your prayers from being answered. Uh, may we live as the husbands and wives God would have us to be. Father, thank you for your word. We pray earnestly, Lord, that you would help us uh, to understand it. Help us to understand it both academically, Lord, as we look at it, and it's a difficult passage, but help us to understand it as it pertains to our lives, to our marriages, to our counseling, to our standards as a church family. Uh, help us, Lord, to know and do your perfect will. Help all of us, Lord. Equip all of us by your word to be the husbands we ought to be, to be the wives we ought to be, uh, to live for you and to set the standard high for succeeding generations. Lord, the home is, is under attack in our country, in our world. May we as Christians stand by your word and may we live it. May we not just talk about it, but may we live it in how we treat our spouses. Help us to know and do your will, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we close, just one verse, that's what majesty has, number 497. Let's stand together as we sing, As the Deer. Inside the back cover of your hymnal is a chorus we close with, Worthy is the Lamb. Mm -hmm. 